name's Lindsay, and this is Weird. Well, here we are, Weirdos, episode six of Weird, a podcast of curiosities. Are you curious? Well, this week was Valentine's Day, so I thought we could celebrate by talking about the creepiest story of unrequited love that really I have ever heard. A classic love story, boy meets girl, boy falls in love with girl, girl is swept off her feet, and they live happily ever after in their heteronormative storybook bubble. That's what our children's stories like to tell us, unless you're reading original fairy tales, in which case that's not what they like to tell us at at all. Anyway, this is not one of those stories. Although some perhaps view it that way, I personally find it to be more on the side of insidious rather than romantic. This is a macabre tale of unrequited love, an obsession that would extend into death and beyond. This is the tale of Carl Tanzler and his corpse bride, a title that I am hesitant to concede to him as no wedding ever actually took place. Much of the information that I have based this episode on is taken from Carl's pulp fiction publication, Fantastic Adventures, The Secret of Elena's Tomb. Although I typically do value first-hand accounts, it's important to note that Carl was known to exaggerate. He had a reputation for dishonesty and for inflating the truth in somewhat of a grandiose manner, shall we say. I've cross-referenced things wherever possible to validate certain points, and I have consulted multiple sources, but for now, I suggest thinking critically about this account and take it with a pretty hefty grain of salt. So he was born George Carl Tanzler, February 8th, 1877, in Dresden, Germany. He is also referred to as Carl von Kossel or Count von Kossel, though he was never a count by any means. He grew up in a house called Villa Kossel, which, according to Tanzler, was haunted by what he called the White Woman. This woman was allegedly Carl's ancestor, the Countess Anna Kossel, who died in 1765. He had a keen interest in chemistry, painting, flight, astronomy, and, quote, all phenomena of the universe. Carl claimed that as a teenager and a young adult, he had no interest in women, in smoking or drinking, stating, Time seemed too precious to me for such pursuits of a momentary happiness. As a young man living in Villa Castle, he experienced a haunting which would set him on a path of obsession and dark desires. Like a typical haunting, it involved objects moving about, floating tables, curtains set aflame, plates being smashed, and other forms of tomfuckery. Most importantly, however, one of Tanzler's paintings, a portrait of Judith, the Jewess who slew Holofernes, was smashed to the floor and torn across the middle right through the face of the beautiful woman. Being the scientist that he was, he invited some doctors over to take a look and hypothesize about what may have happened. One of these doctors brought his wife, who also happened to be a medium. According to Tanzler, nothing happened to the doctors. The medium, however, had to be taken away because she was driven out by an invisible agency. Tanzler's claims of being obsessed with science yet being fully fixated on the supernatural seemed counterintuitive to me at first. However, spiritualism was booming at the time, which opened the doors for the sciences and the supernatural to experience sort of an interesting duality for a time. The Society for Psychical Research was set up in London in 1882, which was dedicated to exploring non-corporeal phenomenon from a more empirical viewpoint. I hopped onto their website briefly, and this is what they had to say. The second half of the 19th century was a period of intense intellectual ferment as science-based naturalistic explanations increasingly challenged the old religious worldview. At the same time, the new religion of spiritualism led to an explosion of extravagant paranormal claims throughout the Western world and in all strata of society. 
There were stories of apparitions, clairvoyant visions, precognitive dreams, the kind of miraculous events that had been reported since the earliest times, but also something new. Influential mediums claiming contacts with the dead. These were all the subject of fierce debate. Could they be fully accounted for in, in naturalistic terms, or did they point to aspects of consciousness as yet unknown to science? In January 1882, a conference was held in London to discuss the viability of setting up an organization to carry out formal scientific research into these matters. The following months, the SPR was founded, the first learned society of its kind, with the purpose of investigating mesmeric, psychical, and spiritualistic phenomena in a purely scientific spirit. Its leaders quickly created a methodological and administrative framework, including a scholarly journal in which psychical research could be reported and debated worldwide. So the reason I brought up the SPR is to illustrate that at this time, spirituality and science existed in tandem, more so than what we're perhaps accustomed to currently. So Tanzler's obsession with both science and the paranormal together isn't really that far-fetched given the historical and cultural context of the time. And this is going to come up again in a little bit here. As well, Carl himself had some interesting psychological traits, which I believe really contributed to this overall narrative, if indeed he is being factual, as opposed to relaying what he perceives to be true. And this is an important distinction. What an individual perceives as reality or truth may not coincide with what is fact or what is tangibly real. And I will circle back to that later. Following the medium's departure, Carl experienced another visitation from the mysterious phantom. And this time, oh, she brought a friend. Isn't that sweet? Carl awoke around 2 a.m. to two women stooping over his bed. There was a tall woman with snowy white hair who bore an uncanny resemblance to the Countess Anna, and she held the hand of the second woman, who remained somewhat hidden from Tansler's sight. The ghost of the Countess sinuously drew closer to Carl's face as she spoke. I've been trying to attract your attention for quite some time, my boy, but you wouldn't take note. You were too much engrossed in your experiments. That's why I had to use some violence. Now take warning. Do not entangle yourself with the woman represented on the Judith picture. Don't get ensnared by her. She isn't the one who is destined for you. Look here, Carl. I have brought you the bride whom some day you will meet. At this point, the apparition stepped aside and a veil was withdrawn from the face of the second woman. Carl gazed upon the face of the most beautiful being he had ever seen. She had an enchanting face and long, dark hair. But then suddenly both women disappeared and Carl fell back asleep. Tansler claims that he did attempt to rationally justify the visitation, and in his attempt to find a scientific explanation, he consulted with metaphysical resources, psychological and spiritualist literature, which possibly confirms my theory of his dabbling in spiritualism as a general practice, although he does say that he found these resources to be unsatisfactory, to his standards anyway. Tanzler soon embarked on a journey that would take him across several continents in search of this exotic mystery woman that he was meant to marry. He refers to himself as Ulysses while searching for the, the woman revealed to him by the ghost of the Countess. Given who Ulysses, also known as Odysseus, was in Greek mythology, this reference really speaks to Carl's perceptions of grandiosity and embellishment. Odysseus was a heroic figure, and that's a word that's going to come up time and again in this account. Odysseus was a heroic figure who, after fighting in the Trojan War, endured journeys fraught with danger and cannibals and angry gods and monsters so he could return to his doting wife, Penelope. These characteristics of grandiosity and superiority come up time and again in Carl's story. In fact, I tend to think that these observations offer significant insight into his psychology. While abroad, he visited a cemetery in Genoa. 
Here he encountered a marble statue that he says bore a striking resemblance to the woman who was meant to be his bride. He stood in front of the statue for quite some time, noting that the name inscribed was Alina. After repeating the name to himself, Alina, 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 several times, a ghostly girl in a white dress detached herself from the statue and locked eyes with him. Attempts to initiate conversation with the apparition were not received, and she walked away, disappearing amongst the throngs of mourners. He chased after her until nightfall, but finally, finally, he gave up his search. He found himself in Australia, where he became a British citizen and was employed as an X-ray technician and a civil electrical engineer. March 7th, 1912, Tansler claimed to have had another ghostly visitation. At exactly 7 p.m., the storm that had been raging outside his home came to a sudden quiet, and a figure veiled in white appeared at the threshold of his doorway. He observed that she had black flowing hair down to her knees, and through the veil he was able to see that she had dark eyes. He believed it was the same apparition that had been shown to him by the Countess back at Castle Castle. Carl did what any rational and level-headed person would do, and he embraced the apparition and held her close in what he says was divine bliss. The ghost remained with him for a week, and because she didn't speak, he bestowed the name Aisha upon her. Quick interruption in the narrative here, I'd like to point out that around 1920, Carl married a woman named Doris Ann Schaefer. They had two children together, Clarista, who was born in 1924, and she died of diphtheria, sadly, in 1934, and another daughter. She was born in 1922, and this daughter's name was Aisha. Carl and Doris became estranged after they emigrated to America, possibly due to his globetrotting in search of another woman he'd never met that a ghost told him he should marry, but that's just a guess. So the spirit stayed for a week and then left, plunging Tansler into a state of severe depression. He was hospitalized, unconscious most of the time, and claimed to have been consumed by typhoid and malaria fever. When he came around, he was given some letters that had been sent to him since being hospitalized. The first letter he opened contained the tragic news that his father had fallen into a coma March 7th at 7 p.m., the precise same time and date that Aisha appeared to him. The next letter indicated that his father came out of the coma March 10th at 7 p.m., the exact same time and date that Aisha departed. Upon the Great War engulfing the world, Tansler was sent to an internment camp for four years due to his German heritage. He spent four years in the camp, but he, he doesn't go into a ton of detail about it, although he does talk about making friends with some monks and building an organ and this, that, and the other. After the armistice, Tansler went to Rotterdam and boarded the Holland American liner bound for Cuba. His final destination would be the Florida Keys, where his sister lived with her husband. He spent some time in Havana prior to heading to Florida, thinking he may find his ghostly mystery wife, but eventually he made his way to Florida, where he, he bought a piece of land and began to build a home on it. He also acquired an old airplane that he would tinker with, hoping to fly it to an island off of Australia that he claimed to have discovered and therefore owned because I guess it works that way in his head. His ultimate goal was to live out his days with Casper the exotic wife ghost who wasn't Doris on an island he believed was his but wasn't. Tansler was employed at the Marine Hospital at Key West as a pathologist and an x-ray technician. He was merely tolerated by colleagues who saw him as being egotistical. However, he had proven himself to be competent, and so co-workers just kind of let it slide. I think we all sort of know somebody like that. April 22nd, 1930. So this is when shit hits the fan. Tanzler is called in to take a blood test from a woman who had come in for an examination. Carl walks into the room, and lo and behold, look who it is! 
It's the woman he's been pursuing all over the world, the woman shown to him by his dead ancestor years prior, the woman who isn't Doris, and of course, he falls instantly in love. Her name, predictably, is Alina. There's a few issues here. So first of all, she tests positive for tuberculosis, which in 1930 was not exactly great news. Streptomycin wasn't available until 1943, so essentially the treatment for TB, other than telling people to practice good hygiene and not get it in the first place, was fresh air and sunshine. Secondly, Alina was 20 years old at the time. Tanzler was 47. No judgment here, just, just awareness. That was a thing. Thirdly, not only was Tanzler married, but so was Alina. Alina had married Louis Messa in 1926 when she was 16 years old. Sadly, he abandoned the relationship and moved to Miami after Alina suffered a miscarriage. Carl does briefly address the issue of marriage in his account, saying, What, after all, did it matter if she belonged to another? Hadn't I also belonged to another years ago? Our relationship had never been of an earthly nature. Upon learning of the diagnosis, Carl took it upon himself to be personally responsible for Alina's health. He shows up at her family's home and essentially takes charge. During this entire account, Alina and her family often refer to him as doctor, which, as far as I can tell, he wasn't. Despite his claims of higher education, he really exaggerated a lot of things in his life, so personally, I think that was bogus. Moreover, he often refers to Alina as child. For example, during the earlier stages of their interactions, he recalled this exchange. Don't worry over it, and don't worry about anything anymore. From now on, I'm going to take care of you. She thanked me with a happy little smile, and like a child, she said, Yes, doctor, I'm sure you will. So here's where things get fucked up. I mean, they already are fucked up, but this starts to get really seriously fucked up. Carl is thoroughly convinced that Alina is in love with him. Her family has made it like super fucking clear that they don't want him around and that they would rather get help from someone else. Carl even admits in his account that Alina herself told him that she feels he's too old for her. Regardless, he remains absolutely convinced that she loves him and with the same passion that he loves her. Most other resources I checked with confirm that she did not return his affections. Throughout this account, he frequently refers to how they would communicate with gazes and body language, which to me indicates a serious case of erotomania, which is a central theme in many delusions that someone is in love with you when they aren't. A person coping with erotomania type delusions will interpret every look, every glance, every action, every word as having some sort of significance or as being an indication of love. For example, let's say somebody at your place of work is totally fixated on you in this way and they also really like Chinese food and let's say you happen to have had Chinese food the night before and so you bring the leftovers to work the next day for your own lunch, that person might see that as some sort of a, a signal or a message that you're trying to communicate to them your affections for them. So time marches on, and Alina continues to succumb to her illness, as one would. Carl proposes to her, much to the disapproval of her family, and he is summarily rejected. But he's really careful, when, when I was reading this, I, I did notice this, he was really careful to blame the family for this rejection, but not Alina herself. He continued to dote on her and bring her gifts regardless of what she wanted or what her family wanted. He attempted to discredit other practitioners, her family, her parents, her culture, in an effort to convince her to rely solely and completely on him. He wanted to be seen as her heroic savior. At one point in his account, he says, Alina was needlessly made to suffer, almost blindly obedient to her parents like so many Spanish girls. She had followed their advice, trusting implicitly that it would be for the good. So, listen, 
I get that I'm talking about a completely different time and in many ways a completely different culture and perhaps it isn't fair of me to view the story through my modern lens or my modern views. Times have changed as have values, language, expression, psychology, all of that has experienced like a, a massive overhaul since the 30s but I can't I can't help feeling that he was trying consciously or unconsciously to manipulate and coercively control this girl. He used her illness to instill fear. He used her, her culture to instill doubt about her own family. And he grasped at everything around her to try and elevate him to the status of Messiah in her eyes. He even tried to cause her to doubt herself by treating her as a child and viewing her as a thing to be possessed or had. The family finally had enough and told him essentially to get the fuck out and please don't come back. Carl, of course, pined over her and would constantly write to Alina, detailing to her the dreams he would have involving the two of them. Finally, Alina sent her sister with a message to the hospital where Tansler worked, and the message was clear and simple, and it simply said, tell him to dream no more. Moving into 1931, Tansler is still writing to this poor girl. He would tell her that no one else can help her like he can, that he's the only one who can make her well again, that he'll take her away to this South Sea Island that he didn't discover and isn't his by any stretch of the imagination. The family got so fed up that they sold the house and moved, and the neighbors refused to disclose to Tansler where they had gone. So if that doesn't scream, please kindly fuck off, then I really don't know what does. So as a response, Carl, of course, took to creeping around Alina's old neighborhood, peering through curtains and windows to see if he could locate his lost love. A well-intentioned elderly lady, according to Carl, disclosed to him Elena's location, stating that her health had been declining and she desperately needed his help. He showed up at the house, I'm sure to the great exasperation of her family, and thus ensued a screaming match between Tansler and Elena's mother. I also noticed during this exchange that Tansler would address Alina's mom as mother. He would actually call her mother while talking to her. So I'm not sure if this was an appropriate way to address an older woman at the time or if it was a symptom of Tansler's delusion, believing that he and Alina were soulmates and therefore making Alina's mom his mother-in-law. As Alina approached death, she allegedly left the care of her body to Tansler. This according to Tansler, obviously. According to him, the exchange went as follows. If I must die, she said at last, all I can leave you is my body, for I am only a sickly girl, so I can't marry you while I am sick, but you will take care of my body after I am dead, won't you? In Tansler's view, this was what he considered to be their marriage vows. Finally, on October 25th, 1931, Carl received word that Alina had died. You'd think that it would end there, but no, no, that was just the beginning. So I have to say, I am fucking sick of Carl at this point. If you read his entire account, he paints himself as though he's this family's savior. He blames them for Alina's death, blames their culture, blames their intellect, makes them out to be helpless, all in an effort to convince his readers, and maybe even himself, that he is absolutely superior to everyone around him. Other professionals, morticians, like who, it doesn't matter. He had to be right in everything and he had to be the best. He's egotistical and histrionic. He's arrogant and just so completely intolerable. I don't know if I'd last 10 minutes in the same room with this guy. Upon receiving the news that Alina had passed, Carl met with the family who then apparently begged Carl to help them. The father stated that he was quote unquote helpless and that because they were poor, they couldn't take care of Alina's body and so must leave her to Carl. Christ, this guy is insufferable. 
So Carl went about planning the funeral and making all the arrangements. He also started pestering the family about the jewels, the clothing, and the gifts that he had bestowed upon Alina. He was told that they'd all been burned, but Carl, of course, doesn't believe them and continued to press them on the matter. The family finally tells Carl that they're going to move again, and Carl essentially says, too bad, I'm staying in her bed, I'm staying in her house, I'm not leaving. And he did exactly that. He moved into her room and he slept in her bed, feeling, quote unquote, at home in her presence. After a time, Alina's family, allegedly, accepted that Tanzler truly loved her and agreed to allow him to construct a tomb worthy to house her body. He bought a larger plot of land, drew up plans for the tomb, and commissioned a mason to help him with the construction. As the tomb was being built, Alina's casket was housed at the funeral home. The coffin had suffered damage from when it was first put into the ground and the entire casket had been soaked through, accelerating the process of decomposition. Carl decided that this just isn't good enough for his beloved non-wife and proceeds to rebed her body. He used chemicals and sprays and he carefully sponged her face and hands and feet. And despite the fact that she is decomposing, he insisted that the rancid smell was not coming from her body, but rather from the casket. He blamed the mortician for this, appalled at his negligence. He worked all night to clean her body, again positioning himself as her savior, believing that everything that had gone wrong was everybody else's fault. Alina's body was moved to what Tanzler called an incubator tank. He sealed the tank and filled it with a solution that he says was antiseptic and nourishing to the body cells. His intent at this point was to prevent further decay, although he was not about to stop there. Eventually, he returned Alina to her tomb, visiting every single night. Eighteen months passed until one evening, as he was visiting her tomb, he nodded off. He awoke to a loud, crashing noise, akin to the sound of a cannon. Approaching the casket, he noticed that all the locks had sprung open, a phenomenon he claims could have only been committed by Alina. Within the casket, he could hear a tapping sound, like nails scratching the surface. He opened the remaining locks, he lifted the lid, and as he opened the casket, he could smell not decaying flesh, but the healthy, agreeable odor of a young woman's skin on a warm day. Although her corpse didn't move, Tanzler recalled that she spoke to him, saying, You do love me still, don't you? Tell me, am I really dead? They go on to have a little conversation, which, of course, makes him look like her fucking hero, as she begs him to take her away with him. He continued to visit her in her tomb as they plotted how to break her out of her prison so they could be together. Keep in mind, she is an inanimate corpse during this time. She's not up and walking around like something out of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. He is quite literally having a conversation with a corpse and believes that the corpse is somehow talking back to him. Tanzler waited until a dark night during the new moon when he could move about the cemetery unseen. Using a giant blanket and a tiny wagon, he made off with her body. He states, All of the cemetery was alive with souls which came out of the graves from all sides, moving and thronging all around us. It was indeed like a great divine wedding march for me taking place. Escaping the graveyard, he moved Elena's body to the plane that he had intended to use to whisk them off to their exotic island destiny. Tanzler goes on to do whatever he can to preserve or rejuvenate Alina's body. He actually uses the word resurrect in various places. He used wire to secure her skeleton and fashioned a wig from hair salvaged from when Alina had cut it short. He used plaster and wax to fix her skin, implanted glass eyes, filled her body cavities with rags. He dressed her in clothes 
and donned her with jewelry, and finally he laid her out in his own bed where he would lay with her, he would kiss her, he would breathe life into her, and he would sleep with her. Although Carl himself would deny any kind of necrophilic relationship, subsequent exams of poor Elena's body have indicated that he did consummate their so-called marriage as he pursued his obsession with not only preserving her body, but resurrecting it as well. Some sources that I read stated that a tube was found inserted into her genital areas so that he could perform husbandly duties, shall we say, on her corpse. Weeks turned into months. Months turned into years. His delusions deepened as he was convinced she would breathe while drinking wine he had given to her using his own lips, or that she would, for periods of time, awaken and sit up and speak to him in a loving manner. After seven years of this, people naturally became suspicious. Tansler had been seen dancing with what was thought to be a giant doll, and his behavior surrounding his plane had become noticeably bizarre. Finally, Alina's sister saw the body in Tansler's home and promptly had him arrested for gravesite desecration. He stood accused of wantonly and maliciously demolishing, disfiguring, and destroying a grave. Tansler was completely unremorseful during the trial, insisting that his undying love for Alina was surely enough justification for what he had done. Due to the statute of limitations expiring, the charges were dropped and Tansler walked away a free man. In the meantime, incredulously, poor Alina's body was put on display at the funeral parlor where people could pay one dollar to come see her. According to Tansler, and I don't know about the accuracy of this number, over 6,850 people went to view the body. She was eventually buried yet again, but there is one final possible twist to this already twisted tale. While Tansler was living with Alina's corpse, he made wax and plaster replicas of her, and they were life-sized. Carl died in July of 1952, and when his body was discovered three days later, so were these replicas. Allegedly, he was buried with one of these life-sized clones. However, some sources say that he had managed to pull a bit of sleight of corpse magic and switch one of his replicas with her real body before she was laid to her final rest, giving Carl what he ultimately wanted to be with Alina forever, even in death. There is just so much wrong with this story, and I don't even know where to begin. Between Carl's schizotypal traits, along with his erotomania and his total absence of a moral compass, I find him incredibly difficult to view as a protagonist. I have this image in my head of Carl clutching Alina's body, whether it be a replica or not, as he takes his last dying breath. Like an even more deranged version of The Hunchback of Notre Dame, which, side note, that's your book recommendation for the week. Go read it and then pretend the Disney film didn't happen. Many of the sources I encountered would refer to Carl as a hopeless romantic, which I find flabbergasting, particularly in this day and age. What he did, it, it, it wasn't romantic, and it certainly wasn't love. I've tried to look at the story in the context of the 1930s, but still, I, I'm i sorry, it just it makes my skin crawl regardless. So I'm glad that's over. Let's move on to what's weird this week. Even though I, you know, I kind of highly doubt we'll hear anything weirder than what we just heard, but that's all right. So a 74-year-old Georgia man claims that he lost his virginity at the age of 17 to extraterrestrials. David Huggins has stated that his first close encounter with the third kind happened in 1961, but the sexy solicitations didn't stop there. The aliens would return well into his adulthood, with his latest tryst being a mere six months ago. Huggins left Georgia in the 60s and claims that the aliens followed him, referring to one of them, the one who he first had sex with, by the name Crescent. 
They had repeated encounters together, calling her at one point his girlfriend. Huggins, an avid painter, uses his talent to illustrate his experiences. He first started painting his encounters in 1987 and continues the practice to this day. You can hear more about David's story and his erotic encounters and sexy paintings in the recent documentary, Love and Saucers. And that's a wrap for this week, weirdos. If you liked what you heard and you'd like to hear more, please rate, subscribe, and review on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, Google Play, and other podcast providers. You can also catch me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at The Weird Pod. And of course, there's the website, theweirdpod.com. And hey, I'd love to hear from you. Have you experienced something weird that you'd like to share? Drop me a line and who knows, maybe I'll talk about it in an episode. Or maybe not. I don't know. No promises. Thanks for tuning in, weirdos, and until next time, stay weird. Stay weird.